to be a child of God today. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. I am so honored to be here preaching today on this blessed day. Pray with me. Lord God, into your hands I commend my spirit. I pray that you would speak through me, Lord God. Let it not be me, but let it be you. In Christ, our beloved, we do pray. Amen. So on this blessed Sunday, we turn our gaze to our youth and God's presence and provision in their lives. Uh, We focus on how God is moving in their midst and even still is calling them, as God called the patriarchs and the prophets, the matriarchs and the models of faith. You see, that's my key word for today is call. Our youth are our example of a faithful answer to God's call. Now, many of our youth will pack their bags and answer the call to do ministry with some wonderful churches in Puerto Rico this summer. And many have answered the call to serve the church in different leadership and service roles. And yet, still many of our seniors will answer the call to embark on new journeys into unknown lands and places, stepping out on faith. This echoes the story of Abraham at the time he was called Abram and his call from God. Hear ye these words. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless those and curse those who curse you. And in, in, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of God's word. Now, just a little bit of a disclaimer. I do want to remind you, the last time I was here, uh, I, uh, when, when I preached here last time, I said, uh, it is okay and encouraged to talk back to me. So if you feel like you want to say, thank you, Lord, please go ahead. If you feel like you want to say mercy, Lord, that's okay, family. We can speak back today. Can the church say amen? Oh, can the church say amen? Oh, there we go. And then now now here we don't get a lot of background from the previous verses verses about Abraham. We get a little bit of his genealogy, uh, and uh, and we find the fact that he took a wife. Her name was Sarai, and she was soon to become Sarah. And one day, out of the blue, the voice of God booms from heaven like a, like a heavenly surround system. And God tells Abram, hey, get up and go. Abram is 75 at this point. He had established a life with his wife. And they hadn't had children yet, but I'm sure he was living it up, comfortable, only needing an offspring to finish the, uh, the package deal. But then God comes in and messes up Abraham's wonderful life on the North Shore. I'm sorry, in ancient biblical times. Living in his beautiful home with his nice car. I'm so sorry, I mean camels. With his backyard swimming pool. God says, pack your bag, buddy. I've got something for you. And Abraham does it. He gets his wife his nephew Lot and all of their possessions and and they get out of Dodge. Now, now let's not overlook the fact that God doesn't in our transliteration of this interaction, God doesn't tell Abraham where the where to go. God just says to Abraham, "Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you." Now, I don't know about you, but I I feel uneasy if I'm going anywhere and and I don't have my GPS directing me. Even the drive from my, mu- my, my apartment in Evanston to my parents' apartment on the south side of Chicago has me pulling up Apple Maps for directions. I need to know if there are accidents. I need to know if there are roadblocks ahead. I need to know what's going to happen. I need to know the way. But God doesn't give Abram a play-by-play of what is about to happen. God just says, go to the place that I will show you. Abram just got the call of a lifetime. But this isn't a call to fame, fortune, or fortitude. Instead, it is a call to faithfulness. Repeat after me, faithfulness. 
This call foreshadows the well-known proverb that says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. But in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. God calls Abram out of his comfort zone, out of his perceived safe space, a call to come out of what he's known his whole life and to trust God to do something with all of who he was. In almost every moment, listen here, in almost every moment that, that God creates a covenant with Abraham, God repeats the phrase, I will. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. I will bless. I will curse. Have you all heard of the movie called Onward? It's this Disney movie about a young boy, I believe his name is Ian, from this fantasy land of enchanted creatures and magical stones that harness supernatural powers. This boy is the youngest of two with a widowed mother, and this whole movie centers around his journey to find a certain stone to reincarnate his deceased father for just a moment. And at one point, they come to this chasm. And on the other side is the bridge, but it is let up. And the handle to let the bridge down is on the other side. In order to get to the other side and let down the bridge, the boy has to get across this bottomless emptiness. He has a goal, but there's something in his way. He had this empty pit. His brother tells him that he has the ability to get across by creating what he calls a trust bridge. And he says, you won't, kn you won't know if the bridge works until you step on it. If you believe that the bridge is there, it is there. Now, of course, the younger brother is very trepidatious. He's not about to step out on nothing ex and expect there to be something. So his older brother ties a rope around his waist. And he says to him, now you won't need this, but go ahead. So the younger brother gets ready and he, he steps out and then he falls into the pit only being saved by the rope. Now the older brother says basically now that you aren't dead and you see that you aren't going to die, let's try this again. But you have to believe with every step. And so the younger brother gets ready. You see him take a deep breath, fear radiating from his face. But he believes. He steps out, and this time when he steps out, he steps out on what seems to be this enchanted magical bridge that we can't really see, but we know it's there. And then he takes another step, and another step, and another step, and before you know it, after a little bit of craziness and, and chaos, you find he's on the other side. He gets across. Oh, what we could accomplish if we would realize no matter what the bottom li bottomless pit that the world might put in front of us, God has already bridged the gap. God has already secured the way to our purpose and our goals. God has, through God's faithfulness, set us up for greater. God just asks us this, will you be faithful? You may not see the bridge, but step on out and know that I will hold you. Will you trust me if you would only trust me? I got you. This call to faithfulness is to see the constant and awe-inspiring faithfulness of God. It's almost a call to see what God is doing, a call for discipleship. Now, in the most recent years, I've been trying to read some different theologians, and I found a book by uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and I've become a bit of a Bonhoeffer fan. And he says, as he talks about discipleship, the disciple is thrown out of the security of life into complete insecurity, which in truth is absolute security and protection in community with Jesus. Y'all missed it. That was your shout moment, but I'm going to keep going. <laughs> out of the foreseeable and calculable realm, which in truth is unreliable, into the completely unforeseeable coincidental realm, which in truth is the only necessary and reliable one. Stay with me here. Out of the realm of limited possibilities, which in truth is, uh, which is of the unlimited possibilities, into the realm of unlimited possibilities, which in truth is only liberating, is the only liberating reality. He says this, it is nothing other than being bound to Jesus Christ alone. 
We hear Jesus extending this call to his disciples when he says, follow me. He says in Matthew 4, 18 through 19, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And, and he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Matthew 9, 9 says, as Jesus was, was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax collection station. Jesus called tax collectors, help me, God. And he said to him, follow me, and he got up and followed him. Being a college graduate, going on, oh, I'm sorry, let me go back, I, I missed a prayer. Just like the voice of God called Abram out as Elsa once said into the unknown, so did the word of life. The word of God, as John calls him, calls the disciples out into the unknown. And so has the call has been extended to our graduating seniors who are called to find their place and make their impact. And so are you called to continue to follow Christ even deeper in love and community. Now, being a college graduate of five years now, there is a lesson I learned that we must be willing to accept. The call to faithfulness, listen here, the call to faithfulness does not exclude hard times. I'm going to say that again. The call to faithfulness does not exclude hard hard times. Now, uh, John 16, uh, 33, Jesus uh, has been in reflective celebration of the Passover celebration with his friends. And in his final farewell, he begins, uh, before he begins the grueling but redemptive process of carrying the cross, he says to his friends these words. He says, do you now believe the hour is coming? Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each one to his home, and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have said this to you so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will face persecution, but take courage. I have overcome, I have conquered the world. Now, the Greek word for overcome here, and I, I do like to look at the Greek word sometimes. Uh, the Greek word here for overcome is nanaikika, which means to subdue, to prevail, to obtain victory over. And in a more appropriate and reverent way, Jesus basically tells his disciples, listen here, you're bound to have some hard nights. You're, you're bound to have some sleepless nights where you cry yourself to sleep. You're, you're bound to have moments where your faith seems small and your giants look humongous. You're bound to have moments where everything seems stacked against you. You will have haters. You will have people. People who oppose you every chance they get. You will see atrocities that will make your stomach curl. You will have moments where you sometimes lament and mourn. Jesus here proclaims the negativities of human nature. Jesus says humanity for right now is bound to suffer because of the brokenness of our world. There is pain, there is strife, and there is tribulation. But Jesus puts a, a but here. And I love this turn of phrase. Jesus places a comma to our suffering and not a period. Here Jesus places the cross that identifies with human suffering and, and places the turnaround button that reverses the effects of suffering. He, Jesus here inserts himself on the cross, arms outstretched, looking into the face of suffering individuals and says, be of good cheer, take courage, take heart, be encouraged, hold on to hope. I have overcome, I have subdued, claimed victory over and prevailed over the world in the grace of the cross. Jesus breaks the power of sinful nature's death and evil and, and claims victory and eternal life for all who taste and see that the Lord is good. We've been given victory through Jesus over our downfalls, over our shortcomings, and over our circumstances. It says in Romans 8.31, if God is for us, who can ever be against us? And this verse is asked as a question, but the cross turns that question into an exclamation. It says, it's no longer if God is for you, but rather it is the truth of all truth that the God of heaven, the creator of heaven and earth is for you and is for me. So therefore, nobody can stand against you. The call to faithfulness shows us that despite what our circumstances looks like, despite how fallen our nature can be, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Are y'all with me today? The grace of the gospel is that for every Good Friday we experience, God is faithful to bring about Easter Sunday moments. 
David taught us that for every Goliath we face, God is faithful to use our five smooth stones to create us into kings and conquerors. Moses taught us that for every Pharaoh we face, God is faithful to use our voice to pave ways for deliverance and healing. Joseph taught us that for every brother that sells us into slavery and for every supervisor's wife that lies on us, God will use their attempts to set us up. God will use it to set uh, the, their attempts to set us back. God will use their attempts to set us up for our greater and for deliverance. Esther taught us that for every Haman you face, God will cast down every attack and assignment of evil against your life and call you to prevail. Even Paul taught us that for every moment of misunderstanding and misjudgment that we enter spiritual blindness, God will use our testimony to become the means by which many come to know the grace and love of God. Knowing this, that the call of faithfulness reminds us through the stories of our spiritual ancestors, that the provision, that the providence, and the presence of God has already gone before us and fought the battle and won the war. Yes, in this world, you will have tribulations. Yes, you will have opponents. Yes, you will have haters. People will break your heart. They will talk about you. They will try to tear you down. They will try to divert you from your divine assignment from God. They will try to deter you. You will have moments when college seems almost impossible. You will have moments when you want to throw in the towel. You will have moments when you want to quit and go back home. You will have moments when it feels like you're in the valley of the shadow of death. But if faithfulness has taught me anything, it is that if God can do it for Abraham, Joseph, Moses, David, Esther, P, Paul, Peter, and even Jesus, God can do it for me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they come for me. Thou preparest the table for me in the presence of my haters. I'm so sorry, I meant to say enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell, I will rest in, I will take my place in the house of the Lord forever. The cross has taught me, I'm getting ready to close, stay with me. The cross has taught me that Good Friday may come, but Easter Sunday is just around the bend. You may have to sit in some Holy Saturday waiting for just a bit. But take courage. Take heart. Be of good cheer. He has overcome the world. You have overcome your circumstances. You have overcome your tests. You have overcome your trials. You have overcome your haters. You have overcome your pain. You have overcome your tears. You have overcome through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, it, it may not have manifested yet, but God who is faithful will see it through. And uh, in my home faith, we used to sing a song that said, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know thus say the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust him. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that he is with me, will be with me till the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. call of a lifetime is a call to faithfulness. Listen here, a call to be faithful to God because no matter what, even in Abraham's unfaithfulness, God was faithful. Even in our unfaithfulness, God is faithful. Even when we turn our backs on God, God is faithful. The call of a lifetime is to taste and see the faithfulness of God. Even when your money is acting funny and your kiddos are acting like weirdos and your soul is in filling whole, God is faithful to take the broken pieces of your life and as the potter sits at the wheel, mold your life and put you back together. God was faithful to Abraham. 
the children's ministries, they sing a song, Father Abraham has many sons. And many sons has Father Abraham. I one of them, and so are you. So let's be friends. Hey, you see, I encourage you. Taste and see God's faithfulness. Taste and see what God is doing. Look and behold God's faithfulness in your life. Even when the circumstances and the giants and the bottomless pits try to put intimidation into your heart, say, Jesus, I don't know what's ahead of me, but I know this, you are faithful. So I will hold on to you, no matter what. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.